Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. By now, we're all familiar with crimes and criminals on Wall Street. Bernie Madoff, Enron, Ivan Boesky, Barry Minko, and many others have become household names. Across the country, though, the startup world of Silicon Valley has been somewhat spared from any taint. The world of insanely great products, do no evil, and bringing friends together has, at least until recently, kept much of its patina. It's a world where people want to see the future and want to be a part of it. As such, it was and probably still is the most fertile ground for fraud. And perhaps no one has perpetrated a greater fraud than Elizabeth Holmes and her company Theranos. The story of a company whose mission was to tell you everything about your blood with a simple finger prick seemed too good to be true. And like most things that seem too good to be true, it was. The story of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos is told edge-of-the-seat style by my guest John Cario in his new book, Bad Blood. Cario is a two-time Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter at the Wall Street Journal. He's been awarded the George Polk Award for Financial Reporting, the Gerald Loeb Award for Distinguished Business and Financial Journalism, and it is my pleasure to welcome him here to talk about Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup. John Cario, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. First of all, let's tell our listeners that, that may not know a little bit about what Theranos was set up to do. What was it that Elizabeth Holmes was selling from the very beginning? So her, her uh, premise and, and conceit was that um, uh, with her uh, system, her device, you would be able to prick a uh, finger, get a, a drop or two of blood uh, from your finger, and be able to run the full range of lab tests. Uh, off of that tiny sample. And when you talk about the full range of tests, you're talking about anywhere from several hundred to several thousand uh, blood tests. And um, that is simply something that, that uh, hadn't been possible until then. Um, uh, it's very difficult uh, technically to do. No one had cracked that nut. And so it would have been uh, a scientific advance. And um, she argued that it, it would make blood testing more convenient uh, and more user-friendly. People would get their blood tested more often and therefore uh, diseases would be diagnosed at an earlier stage. And as she liked to say at the height of her fame, uh, people would have to say goodbye to loved ones, would not have to say goodbye to loved ones too soon anymore. And she started this back in 2003 when she was 19 years old, a 19-year-old Stanford dropout. Talk a little bit about those early days, the very beginning of this. Right. So she um, started her undergraduate studies in uh, 2002, and then just 18 months later, as a 19-year-old sophomore dropped out, um, she uh, convinced uh, her engineering professor, Channing Robertson, that that it was a good idea, and and he uh, gave her his support and backing and actually joined uh, the fledgling company's board and accompanied her on... um, some visits to to venture capitalists on Sand Hill Road, the the famous uh, road where all the the VCs in Silicon Valley are clustered, just a stone's throw from the Stanford campus. And um, at first, her idea was um, that she was going to create a little arm patch, a sort of a wrist device that would have these micro needles and that would uh, diagnose what ailed you and simultaneously inject the appropriate drug to cure you. Um, She and her co-founder quickly realized that that was more science fiction than reality. And so they pivoted uh, to something that they thought was more feasible, which was inspired from the portable glucose monitors that diabetes patients use to test their blood sugar. But of course, Elizabeth Holmes wanted uh, her device to to test for everything, to pretty much every analyte uh, uh, in the blood. To what extent did she believe this story early on? To what extent did she believe that she could do this? I mean, I think she did. This isn't uh, a Bernie Madoff-like story in the sense that Bernie Madoff in the late 80s, uh, at a certain point, just uh, decided to stop really investing his investors' money and and decided to cheat and then went on to cheat for 25 years. Um, It's less black and white than that. I think Elizabeth Holmes dropped out of Stanford uh, with a, a vision that she truly believed in and that she uh, set about pursuing, and she really uh, wanted to become a successful entrepreneur. Um, and and it's a story of someone who, along the way, encountered setbacks like most entrepreneurs do, uh, trying to develop their technology, and 
and and refuse to um, sort of acknowledge them and and um, and fix things and and she she refused to stop over promising and she continued to over promise to investors and eventually the gap between what she was promising she had achieved and what she had actually achieved got enormous and and it became this massive fraud to to use the uh, securities and exchange commission's own language what was the tipping point? It was around 2011, eight years after she had started, that she started assembling this incredible high-powered board that included the likes of, of George Schultz and Henry Kissinger and, and the relationship with Murdoch and, and all the others. At what point did it, do you think that it became clear to her that this may not work? Well, there were three iterations of the technology. The, the first one that they worked on for a couple of years was a microfluidic system, and, and, and that was actually an ambitious uh, uh, attempt to, to, to change uh, blood testing, and, and she ditched that after a few years in late 2007. And then the, the second uh, iteration of the technology, as I describe in the book, was essentially a, a converted glue dispensing robot. Um, and, uh, you know, a, an engineer at Theranos had ordered this, uh, this glue robot from a company in New Jersey and reprogrammed it, affixed a pipette to the end of the robotic arm and reprogrammed it to mimic, uh, what a lab scientist would do at the bench. And so from that point forward, uh, the Theranos technology was no longer really, uh, any, uh, any great, uh, innovative technology. Um, but she, uh, nonetheless, you know, plowed forward and continued to make very grandiose representations to potential investors, to these board members that she recruited. She met the former Secretary of State George Schultz in 2011. He, he's always been passionate uh, about science. He was wowed by what she claimed her technology could do. He joined the board. Then he introduced her to his buddies at the Hoover Institution, uh, the likes of Henry Kissinger and Sam Nunn and Bill Frist and Bill Perry, who had been Secretary of State under uh, Bill Clinton. And, uh, and before long, she had this unbelievable board, uh, you know, with these, these uh, former statesmen and retired mili military commanders with uh, great resumes. Um, uh, however, um, uh, none of them had any uh, really experience in medicine or, or expertise in, in lab science. And, and in hindsight, that was a big red flag. Was there some kind of Rubicon crossed when she started testing this, when she made the deal with, with Walgreens and started testing this on, on average citizens? Talk a little about that. Right. I mean, that, that's really the, the very bright red line that she crossed, uh, and that was in September of 2013. She commercialized, effectively, the, the Theranos finger stick blood tests in Walgreens stores via partnership with Walgreens and started out in one store in Palo Alto and then expanded to about 45 stores in the Phoenix area. And, and that's when this, uh, this fraud goes from, you know, over promising to investors and perhaps, uh, defrauding investors to actually, uh, hurting patients and putting patients in harm's way. Um, and, and that to my mind is, uh, what makes this scandal, you know, egregious and, and on par, if not worse, than, than some corporate scandals that we've had in the past, such as Enron. To what extent did she know that this was perpetrating a fraud? To what extent was she deluding herself? Talk a little bit about the, the, the human side of that with her, with Elizabeth Holmes. Right. Well, it's hard to know what exactly was going on uh, in her head. Um, I tried to interview her for five and a half months before my first investigative story in late 2015, and then sporadically uh, uh, tried again uh, to get her to talk to me, tried again at the beginning of my book leave in late 2016, and she has steadfastly refused to speak to me. Um, based on all the reporting I've done, and this story has now consumed more than three years of my life, I can tell you that she was very much aware of uh, the corners that were cut and the, the shenanigans in the lab um, you know, she, she herself, uh, uh, requested updates on this, uh, this secret, uh, program they had going that they called the Advia project, which involved hacking a Siemens, uh, blood analyzer called the Siemens Advia 1800. And, uh, and they were modifying it to try to adapt it to tiny finger stick samples to make up for the fact that their own machine, the Edison, which was, you know, at its heart, a converted glue dispensing robot 
could only do a few tests. And, and she, so she was absolutely on top of, of these shenanigans and, and, and requested uh, frequent updates from the, the two people that, uh, you know, that she had ordered uh, to make the modifications. Tell us a little bit about her being the celebrity that she became. She was on the cover of so many magazines. She was lauded. Um, I, in 2015, Joe Biden visited the company. Talk about how she responded to that. Right. She, she really um, began to bask in the limelight um, in a way that arguably uh, no other Silicon Valley tech founder has. Um, and sure, you know, there have been uh, uh, Silicon Valley founders who, who have gotten a lot of press um, and, and who have uh, made, a, made a lot of media appearances and continue to make a lot of media appearances. But she really uh, basked in it in the way that, that a movie star almost would bask in it. She, there got a point there got, we got to a point in uh, 2014 and 2015 when she was giving a media interview almost every week and she was appearing at a, a tech or a healthcare conference almost every week. Um, when, when I came along and I started digging into the company, uh, it wasn't even as, and I, as I, I sort of monitored her, her public appearances, it got to the point where it wasn't even credible that, that she was actually running this company uh, day to day because she was um, her public profile was so high and she was so active uh, with these, these public appearances. And, and as I learned from talking to my sources, the guy who was running the company day to day was her number two executive, Sonny Balwani, who um, was 19 years older and, and who was her boyfriend. And they, they were in the secret relationship that they were hiding from everyone, um, from employees, from the board of directors, from investors and, and from the media. Part of what made this publicity generate so effectively was this desire on the part of the media to want to find a, a star woman Silicon Valley executive or a star woman entrepreneur in the Valley. That's right. Um, you know, there, there have really only been men uh, that, that have achieved uh, fantastic wealth and, and, um, you know, uh, have become these revered uh, tech founders in the Valley, started with, you know, Steve Jobs and Larry Ellison. Um, more recently, uh, we've had the Google founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Uh, we've had uh, uh, Twitter's uh, founders, um, Jack Dorsey. We, we have um, more recently even uh, Evan Spiegel. I'm forgetting, of course, Mark Zuckerberg of uh, Facebook. All, all of these male tech founder billionaires, and there hasn't been a woman. Um, there have been a couple of women who've uh, had great careers in Silicon Valley. Marissa Mayer comes to mind. Um, she was at the helm of Yahoo for several years, and Sheryl Sandberg was Zuckerberg's number two at Facebook. But they uh, aren't founders. They, they were the hired help when they started in Silicon Valley. They were early employees of Google. And, uh, and so they didn't found their own companies and um, there was great appetite, I think, in Silicon Valley and beyond for the first female founder who would become a billionaire. And, and, and Elizabeth Holmes, the, the Valley, had found finally that first woman. Was there ever a point from your reporting that she realized this was never going to work? You know, I, I think to some extent that she is still convinced that she can somehow pull it off. And and. Uh, I'm told that she has accepted the inevit sorry the inevitability of um, uh, Theranos going bankrupt, and and she's really just turning on off the lights there. There are 20 employees left, and and the company should be liquidated in, in a week or two, or sorry, in a month or two. Um, but I'm told that she's also beginning to pitch a new company uh, that she's already approached potential investors about a, a new company, and that it would involve uh, some of what she had been working on at Theranos. And so I, I think to this day, she still thinks uh, she can rebound from this and, and maybe pull off the original vision of this blood testing machine that would test a, a tiny sample of blood. And, and they would even, um, you know, that you would have at home um, and you would prick your, your finger at home and you'd, you'd have your blood test results beamed wirelessly to your doctor. That, that was the original vision and the vision she's clung to all these years. And I think part of her is, is still... Uh, hell-bent on, on achieving it. Talk a little bit, John, about how you came to this story, because that's part of the book as well. Right. 
So uh, I read uh, a profile of Elizabeth Holmes in the New Yorker magazine in late 2014. Um, that was what put her on my radar. Uh, she had uh, rocketed to fame about a year prior. Um, and uh, there were a couple passages in that New Yorker story that struck me as odd. Um, the main thing was this notion that uh, a college dropout with no formal training in medicine or, or medical uh, science uh, could just drop out and, and, you know, create groundbreaking new, uh, medical technology. I thought that was far fetched. Um, and to be fair, I probably would not have done anything with that intuition if I hadn't gotten the tip a few weeks later. Um, that tip came from a, uh, pathologist in the Midwest who, uh, moonlighted as, uh, the writer of an obscure blog called the pathology blog, which he spelled B L A W G. And this pathologist had, also read the New Yorker story and knowing a thing or two about blood testing also, uh, you know, was dubious about the claims in there and, and wrote a skeptical blog item on his blog and was quickly approached by a little band of Theranos skeptics, one of whom uh, had been involved in patent litigation with Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos and had come to and had become convinced during that litigation that Theranos was a scam. Um, and it so happened that, that that man, Richard Fuse, had just made contact with a, uh, an ex-laboratory director at Theranos who had just left the company. And so when I heard via the first the um, pathology blog writer and then Richard Fuse that there was a, an employee who had just left the company uh, who, who was alleging all manner of wrongdoing, my ears pricked up and, and I um, uh, sought to get in touch with that employee and, and eventually did make contact with him. He was terrified. Uh, he was being uh, harassed and hounded by uh, Theranos lawyers. Uh, he would only speak to me uh, on deep background. Um, he made me promise that I would protect his, his identity and um, eventually got him to confide in me and unburden himself. And, and that's how the, the whole reporting began. And one of the other whistleblowers in this was uh, George Schultz's grandson, Tyler Schultz, who was working for the company. Right. Tyler became a corroborating source a few weeks later, um, and uh, he had gone to work for Theranos after graduating from Stanford in uh, the fall of 2013 and had worked at the company eight months and, and had become convinced that the, the company uh, was a fraud and had uh, even tried to um, talk sense into his grandfather and, and sort of open his eyes to what was going on and failed and had had to leave uh, Theranos a, a year before I started digging into the company and, and keep all of this bottled up. Um, and I uh, made contact with him and he became a, a crucial corroborating source because uh, he and, and another ex-colleague were able to uh, corroborate and confirm a lot of the things that the lab director had told me. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Theranos soon um, was able to figure out that he was one of my sources and, and put him under an enormous amount of pressure, um, had uh, lawyers ambush him at his grandfather George's house off the Stanford campus um, and, and put, put him under pressure for months um, with legal threats, tried to get him to, to sign statements essentially recanting what he had told me and uh, naming who my other sources were. And uh, Tyler had to hire lawyers uh, to represent him uh, uh, at the cost of uh, close to half a million dollars. And, and uh, amazingly, was able to withstand this pressure and never gave in, um, never signed any document that the company put to him. And, and in large part, thanks to him, I was able to publish my investigation in October of 2015. At its height, the company had some 800-plus employees. What were they all doing at that point? Yeah, well, the interesting thing about Theranos is that when my first story came out, a lot of employees um, thought that um, I was wrong. I mean, the, uh, Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani, the, the two people at the head of the company, were telling them that I was wrong and, and that my reporting was uh, essentially seeded by disgruntled former employees and by the two big incumbents in the lab industry quest in lab corp. And, um, and so they believe them. Uh, the reason they believe them is that very few employees knew about the shenanigans in the laboratory. Um, the, the company was set up, uh, in silos and, um, uh, very few people had access to the laboratory where they had modified these Siemens machines. Um, and so very few people knew 
uh, that that uh, only a handful of tests were were uh, done with the Theranos device, and that the rest were done with third-party machines um, purchased from from diagnostic equipment companies. The SEC has made its determination on this and determined that that fraud was going on here. Talk a little bit about the criminal side and what's happening on that front, particularly with the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco. Right. So there's been a criminal investigation that started in uh, December of uh, 2015. So we're now two and a half years into it, spearheaded by the U.S. Attorney's Office in, in San Francisco. Um, I'm told it's very active. Uh, several uh, key uh, former Theranos employees have been interviewed, and I believe they're uh, being lined up by, by the federal government as witnesses. Um, uh, prosecutors have also gone out to Arizona and interviewed uh, doctors and patients who, who were affected by uh, Theranos' actions. And um, from everything that I hear, um, the, the, the investigation is very advanced and uh, criminal charges of Elizabeth Holmes and her ex-boyfriend, Sonny Balwani, are a distinct possibility. Based on, on your reporting, and, and certainly not having talked to Elizabeth Holmes, but everything else that, that you have seen, at what point did this become criminal behavior? Well, you, you could make the, the case that it was uh, criminal, criminal behavior as soon as she went live with the blood tests uh, that were you know, blood tests done with modified commercial machines mm-hmm. for the most part, and a few of them with Theranos machines that didn't work and weren't properly validated. And you could say that for two reasons. One is that uh, she raised most of the nearly billion dollars she raised over 12 years after uh, going live in, in Walgreens stores. And she was able to raise that money because she said to, to those investors who came in, in those last rounds, look, you know, obviously our product is for real and works. Otherwise, we wouldn't have commercialized it in Walgreens stores. So she used the, the commercialization of the, of the product to attract more than $700 million in, in funding in uh, late 2013, 2014, and 2015. So that's, you know, basically securities fraud. It certainly has been called that by the SEC and it, its charges. And then the, the other reason is, is that they went live with this, uh, this non-working technology um, and they uh, exposed uh, patients to faulty blood tests. But they also lied to regulators. Um, they didn't um, uh, show regulators the, the part of their lab downstairs that contained the, the modified Siemens machines and, and the Edison uh, machines. They only showed uh, regulators the, the upstairs part that had regular machines uh, running regular Venus draws. And so uh, one regulator in particular, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is the chief regulator of clinical labs in this country, was hoodwinked by Theranos, and, and you, you could make a case that the FDA was also mit- misled. Um, so I think if charges are filed, uh, they'll include securities fraud charges, and they'll also include uh, charges of lying to federal officials, and, and probably there will be some uh, Medicare conspiracy charges too. Yeah, when you, when you see the story of the two labs that she had going simultaneously, it does remind you, though, of Bernie Madoff's two trading rooms that he had going. Right. I mean, there, there is a, a parallel there. Um, I, I think the, the difference with Theranos is that they still had a hope, they, meaning Elizabeth Holmes and, and her boyfriend, Sonny Balwani, that the last iteration of the technology, which they called the mini lab, which they had in development and, and which was merely a prototype that didn't work, I think they had high hopes that eventually they would get it to work and that eventually they would get to a point where they'd be able to use it in the lab and produce accurate results. And, um, and I think their game all along was to hope that the, the development of that technology caught up with all the promises they had made. Um, the problem is that uh, the, the gap between the promises and, and the reality of the technology uh, became too enormous to bridge um, and, and so I would say that, that that's the, the difference between Theranos and, and Madoff. It's the ultimate game of fake it till you make it. Right, right, which is, you know, something that's been going on in, in Silicon Valley for 40 years. Uh, there was a term coined in the early 80s called vaporware right. uh, to describe uh, companies that announced, you know, newfangled software or computer hardware with great fanfare and then either didn't deliver it or, or delivered um, 
versions of it that, that didn't uh, have the features that, that had been promised. And, you know, Steve Jobs and Larry Ellison and, and others uh, were all accused of engaging in the practice at one time or another. Uh, the difference in this case is, is that uh, the product was a medical product. You know, uh, the, the, the vaporware um, usually referred to software. And, uh, and you know, we've had uh, generations of vaporware. I mean, Twitter was, was uh, notorious for having uh, a service that was buggy and that had frequent outages. But um, ultimately, aside from, you know, frustration, uh, it didn't uh, affect really people's lives or it didn't endanger uh, people's lives. The, the Theranos product was a, a blood testing machine that doctors and patients relied on uh, for, for blood test results that they then used to make important health decisions. It's a, it's a whole new ball game uh, when you enter the realm of medicine. And John, finally, in, in the minute or two we have left, talk a little bit about Elizabeth Holmes, where she came from, who she was. Right. So she was raised in Washington, D.C. Her dad uh, was a public servant for most of his career, worked at uh, agencies like the State Department and USAID. Uh, her mom had been a congressional aide until she interrupted her career to raise Elizabeth and her younger brother, Christian. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, Elizabeth's lineage is that um, she was a descendant, descendant of the uh, Fleischmann Yeast family. Um, the Fleischmann Yeast Company was founded in the late 1880s by two Hungarian immigrants, um, Charles and Max Fleischmann, uh, who came to, to America and created this company that uh, became incredibly successful. And by the turn of the 20th century, the Fleischmanns and the Holmeses uh, were one of the richest families in America. And so Elizabeth grew up with uh, uh, these stories that her father would tell her about the the, the great successes of the uh, Fleischmann uh, family, uh, but he also made sure to tell her about the, the failures of the younger generations of the family because his uh, grandfather and his father had squandered the family fortune and uh, had uh, cycled through marriages, struggled with alcoholism, um, and and had essentially uh, frittered away the money. And and so I think those um, those stories were very influential. Uh, as she grew up and then played uh, uh, somewhat of a role in, in her psychology. John Cariou, the book is Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup, and we should say soon to be a major motion picture, yes? That's right. Uh, uh, Jennifer Lawrence is attached to play Elizabeth Holmes. The director uh, is going to be Adam McKay, who directed The Big Short. And um, Vanessa Taylor, who co-wrote The Shape of Water, is currently working on a screenplay. John, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.